I guess uh, there will not be more people joining us now. Um, in the afternoon, what uh, my intention is, I created this eight-page RD tool tutorial exercise booklet, which contains material for about a day's work of exercises, if you're fast, and uh, to get you started with this. Unless someone has any questions, which I can explain, and then I'll be glad to elaborate on any topic regarding RD tool. Yes, question. Why the 19th person? <laughs> You're the third person to ask me today. Okay, so uh, when you're naming data sources in RD tool, you can't um, use more than 19 characters. For most people, this is not a problem. But uh, OpenNMS, people seem to have a problem with this. Um, <coughs> let's look at the source. Now, open uh, RD tool is on GitHub. And I encourage you to have a look there for stuff. Um, in the RD tool source, you'll find a file called RD format. And that's the master description of the RD tool file format. And there you find various things about the structure. So if you ever wonder how the, day, the RD file format is constructed, what is in there, that's the file, that's the documentation. That's why there are so many uh, comments in there so that people can understand what is happening. <coughs> and so what you're looking for is the, um, the data source name, right? Okay, missed it in the first round. So there's supposed to be a structure where I'm defining the data source. Ah, here. So here you see there's a data source definition type and it has a data source name. And the data source name has a size. And there's a define saying data source type size and data source name size. And it's at 20. And since the last character of a string in C is a null, so the maximum data source length is 19 characters. And that's why it's limited to 19 characters. So if you said, OK, 19 is not enough. I want to have 100. Then you would go into RD format H and modify this bit here and recompile. And you'd have a version of RD tool which can deal with longer data source names. But your RD files would not be compatible with all the other RD files. And therefore, uh, probably you would run into more trouble than it's worth. So the only solution to change that would be or to properly change that would be to create a new version of RD tool, of the RD tool format. There's a, a thing called the cookie, the RD, the RD cookie. That's at the very beginning of the RD file. If you look at an RD file, you'll see the, the letters. It starts with RRD, followed by a version number. And this thing here. And so RD tool version 5, for example, could have a longer RD format. 
but then all the all the tools or all the parts of RD tool would be modi would have to be modified to understand version five, and your version five RD files would only work with an RD version five binary. Uh, unfortunately, in the last four versions, this uh, length of the data source name hasn't come to my attention. Therefore, it wasn't changed at the same time as other things. But if I come up with a version five format, uh, I'll certainly make it larger. How large should it be? 21. <laughs> flexible. Uh, so the, the right thing to do would to, have, uh, to make it flexible so that you could store as much information as you want. But that would require the format to be even more fundamentally changed, which then um, makes me think about all those other things which are not optimal in the format, which also would have to be changed, and then uh, it's not happening. But RD tool version 2 will have a new form file format, and certainly all those things will be arbitrary. So you can have names as long as you want. But unfortunately, there's no money for version 2 until now. So <laughs> yeah. The, the best thing you can do for OpenNMS is have some other means of storing the long names and then just mapping them to short names in the file. Or since uh, OpenNMS is using one file per data source normally, you could also have a short name in the data source but a long name in the file. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Okay. So, <coughs> okay, one thing I wanted to show you. See, you don't seem to be so motivated to start with the exercises. Am I, am I reading that correctly? Work, you want to see me <laughs> do the show? <laughs> okay, le let me show you something. <coughs> so since this is an open NMS conference, uh, you already have your tool of choice, obviously, for doing network monitoring, but I want to show you what I've been doing recently. Um, UPS, uh, Cablecom UPS in Switzerland is the largest uh, cable TV provider, and they also sell internet and they need monitoring. And uh, I got a contract to do their backbone monitoring and customer facing monitoring last year together with a colleague. And so we set up a system to do all their network monitoring and we were able to implement something new because they were spending so much money on us. And the new thing I implemented is called Extopus. <coughs> Ever since, since doing MRTG and, and finding it to be a rather uh, successful at the time, I have been thinking about how, how should a monitoring system be to, to really do all those things which MRTG didn't and which I now think they should. And, and so I never got down to actually start writing something. And now with this project, I came up with the idea that it's, it's really uh, silly to try to start writing a monitoring system from scratch these days because there's so many good solutions like OpenNMS and many others which already are very capable at the task of gathering information from all sorts of data sources and storing it into a database like structure be it RD tool or some other database what some of them are lacking is a up-to-date user interface because a lot of engineering has gone into making the core of the application deal with huge amounts of data, being able to access all the latest devices, but making the user experience Web 2.0 hasn't happened in many of them. And so I came up with the idea of Extopus. Extopus is a monitoring aggregator. The idea is that you already have your monitoring in place, and instead of writing a new interface for your existing monitoring system, you'd rather write a new interface which is able to 
pull in information from many different existing monitoring setups. And Exopus is such an idea. <coughs> What this does is it talks to a backend system which does all the, the monitoring. It's in the case of UPS, it's called Taurus, which is also something like OpenNMS, but just different. It's called Taurus. And now that's just the demo system. It's not the actual thing because it's obviously inside a firewall and can't show it, but that's just to show what this interface does. And the cool thing about this interface is that it doesn't actually understand monitoring itself. What it does understand is that monitoring deals with many different things out there, objects, which you do monitor somehow. And you have some data about those objects. But you don't there is no common ground at all. It could be a router where you're monitoring traffic. It could be um, some numerical data about your, your student population, about temperatures in rooms acquired by different systems. And there are no shared things among them, except that they're all objects which you're monitoring. And so what this tool can do is it, ca it can bring all those different objects you have into a tree-like structure, as you're seeing here. And this tree is constructed by looking at the properties of the object. So, like, let's say each of your object has a location property, a town name or a street name. Then you could use the town and the street to order those objects into a tree, starting with the town at the first level and going to the street on the second level. And each object would find a place in that tree, even though the different systems contributed, uh, contributing data to Extopus, they don't know of each other. The only thing you have defined is that every object has to have a street and a town. And then Extopus is able to put everything into a tree. It can deal with millions of objects. I've tested that, it works very fine. And then once you select an object here, or actually that's a group of two objects, <coughs> they show up here with their properties and when you select an object in the interface, that information is sent back to the server. And the server then asks its presentation plugins how to present the information associated with that object. And at the moment, there are presentation plugins in there for Taurus, obviously. But the interface is done in a way so that presentation plugins for all sorts of different systems could be created. So if you had Taurus hooked up to this and there was a presentation plugin for Taurus, then once you selected a Taurus object, uh, I'm saying Taurus, I'm, open NMS, I want to say. If you had an open NMS object in here and you clicked on it and there was an open NMS plugin down here, then it would go to open NMS, query it for some additional information had it draw a graph and then present the graph coming from OpenNMS in this space. And due to the structure of Ex Extopus, it's very simple to create different plugins for different systems. And by presenting an object to all those plugins, the plugins which can deal with the object will pop up and then do their work. And so here, depending on what I select, different plugins will show up here and let me uh, show different information. I can also, and that's all part of Extopus, uh, I can also add those plugins to a dashboard. Pick out a few things from my monitoring system, create my... This goes here, and then uh, let's have some numerical data down here. Port traffic over the last 10 days and move that to the dashboard. And when I come back, reloading this, obviously started again, but now I can 
pick my dashboard and have it repainted. The whole thing is totally dynamic. It adjusts to the sizes of your screen. And that all comes for free once you've created your, your plugins to adapt Extopus to your monitoring system. The whole thing is written in JavaScript. So that user interface is running entirely in the browser. It only talks to the server, which is written in Perl, when it needs new data. So as I'm clicking here on the interface, that all happens in the browser. Only when I select another item here, it goes to the server and asks it how to present that data. It's very interactive and uh, can deal with huge amounts of data. Yeah. So that's what I've been doing instead of writing a, a RD tool 2.0 because that's actually a paid job. And, uh, but it's really cool about UPS Cablecom. They let me uh, open source that. So they paid for the development and uh, said, it, we don't sell software, so it's OK. Open source it. It's all on GitHub. Other questions? Yes? Round robin refers to the fact that when you store your data in RD tool, there is a, a fixed size buffer where the data gets stored. And the first entry gets written to the first. Let me draw a little picture here. So when you store data, RD tool allocates a fixed block of memory on the disk. And as you put in your first element, data element goes here, the second goes here, the third goes here, and so on. Moving down, when it goes here, when it's here, then it jumps back to the beginning and starts overwriting. So it goes in a round robin fashion through this data store. And that's why it's kind of called round robin. So that's the, the basic principle of its way of handling data. OK, so now, um, unless you have another item you want to, OK. <laughs> so, the, so the question is whether I'm the only developer maintainer of RD tool, which uh, leads into the general how does open source work uh, question, I guess. And at least in my experience, most projects have someone who, uh, who feels responsible for it. And so over time, uh, many, many people have contributed to RD tool by writing code because they had a particular problem. So for example, the uh, code for aberrant behavior detection, the one which I, I showed you just at the end of the previous uh, unit, that's been written by WebTV, which was a company in the US, active in the 90s, uh, selling I think set-top boxes to, to houses, and the set-top box had a web browser in there, and they had an uh, elaborate caching infrastructure and were eventually bought by Microsoft. They were, were very heavy users of RD tool, and they wrote the, the aberrant behavior detection to figure out when something was going wrong in their network. And they contributed that code. But then uh, once it was in RD tool, they were happy, and RD tool was doing what they wanted, and they didn't care anymore. So no further patches were coming along from them. And, and so over time, other people have also had phases where they were very actively involved and uh, discussing on the mailing list and contributing, and then they just disappear again. And I'm sort of the only one who, who sticks around. And I initially created it. But uh, so while the code is not all mine, it's the heart, which is all there. So yeah. And if somebody finds a bug in RD tool, I sort of feel responsible for it, even though often it's not in my code, but some code I accepted. And, and so by accepting the code, I, was, I got guilty of, of putting it into RD tool, and then I have to fix the bug.
that's why in open NMS it seems to be that that there are more people who actively contribute code to the system, which is nice. But then again, well, what I also found is that RD tool due to its architecture is not very friendly to many people contributing to it because there is no plugin system or anything like that. It's, it's rather monolithic, even though there are different components, but if you want to modify the graphing engine of RD tool, you, you start touching so many things that if many people start doing that at the same time, it becomes very difficult to integrate those different features in, into one tool. And so if I get to rewrite RD tool, one of the, the design objectives will be to make it much more modular so that it's easier to work on a, on a special feature without affecting all of the other code. And that, I hope, would also uh, let more people contribute to the project. Whereas now the, the hurdle of adding something is really high because it's all so interconnected and, and difficult to access. That for, for many people, I guess, it's just, or maybe they do make a change, but then it never gets to me because they think, ah, it's just too ugly. I can't, can't publish it. Okay, so, uh, yes, you have 45 minutes left. I think we have some more time because uh, <laughs> there's no or other session after this one. Was cancelled? Um, no, it's in the other room. Aha, uh -huh. okay, it's not. Um, yeah, but I, I also have to leave because I have uh, to, okay. a train to catch. So, uh, <coughs> anyway, start with these and uh, I'll guess what I can do is I can slowly walk through the, through the exercises and discuss them with you if you want to, if that's... So who wants to just sit there and, and hack and, and me walking around helping you? Or who wants like, to discuss the exercises together and, and how they should be done? Who's for coding alone? No. Who's for discussing? Okay, okay, so. The way this, this, these four pages of exercise, or these eight pages of exercises are constructed is to have the person who's solving them get into all the different areas of RD tool and figuring out how, how they work together. Which is also what I did in the morning, so you should already have some ideas about those things. So data source types, what data source types do you know? That's the first exercise. There's a fourth one. Gorge, derive, counter, and absolute. So uh, gorge is, to, is for temperature uh, or or any number which immediately goes into the database, which is already a rate or a, a reading of, of something, not a counter. Derive is for situations where you're interested in the rate of change of something. So it's a derive function as in the math operation of deriving something. The, the counter is also deriving the, the, the slope, but the counter assumes that it's always going up, whereas derive allows something to go down as well, so it can go both ways. The counter also has built in the ability to detect 32-bit and 64-bit counter wraps. So if your counter is a 32-bit counter, then it will wrap around. And RD tool will detect that and act appropriately by sort of shifting things around that it can even detect the difference between the wrapped old and new data readings. Uh, absolute is a special type. It always assumes that it's the difference between zero and whatever you entered. So that's for situations where you have, where you're actually deriving 
because it, it tells you how many people enter the room every time you ask. You, you, it tells you, OK, four people have entered the room since you asked last. Then you can use absolute. Consolidation methods. So as the data gets into the RD tool database, it has to end up in, array in an array area so that you can get it out again. And the array areas have consolidation methods associated with them. And there are four basic consolidation methods. You know everything. Go. <laughs> okay. Four consolidation methods. Average, minimum, maximum, and last. Last is uh, well, it's, it's causing problems for many people, I think. Uh, the idea is that you have a graph and you want to know what was the value na what's the value now of that data source and you want to be able to show that and, and people someone contributed the last consolidation method and what the last consolidation method does is it takes a number of inputs and then keeps the last and writes that into the consolidated um, array. Now this means having an array longer than one for last consolidation doesn't make much sense in my eyes. But some people use last for other creative purposes but, or just out of misguided understanding of what it does. I normally don't use last because what you can do if you want to know the last value, there is also a consolidate. There is all, there are also ways in the graph engine which let you let you keep the last value of whatever was painted. You don't need to store that in the database. Aha, uh -huh. okay, yeah, the, there's actually, now there are only those four. Now the question is how, how does the calculation of these uh, aggregates happen? And now there are only four aggregates. Well, you could think of many more. So you could want to have uh, <coughs> some more involved analysis of the data. For example, if you wanted to know how, uh, the spread of your data, you could apply some, some function to figure out how, how the, the uh, I, I keep forgetting the name, how, how uh, spread they are across. Delta? No, no, there's a, uh, ah, maybe it comes back to me. Anyway, there's a special function for that. <laughs> now, it's not implemented, and the reason for this is all those consolidation methods which are implemented are used they have two properties. They, are they can be calculated incrementally. So RD tool does not store every update. It only stores data once it goes into the array. This means that it has to deal with a fixed storage, a fixed amount of storage space to prepare the data before it goes into the array. This means you can't have any consolidation function which requires all the original data in order to calculate whatever goes into the array. Now for average, this is very simple. You just add up the, the, sum, uh, the, the product of the, uh, the duration and the height of whatever you're adding, and then you divide it by the complete time, and then you get the rate for which is to be written into the array. Same for min and max, you always keep the min or you always keep the max, very simple. For last, it's also very simple. But there are other consolidation functions which you could use, but you can't because they would need all the original data in order to calculate whatever goes into the slot. And then there's the section, second condition. Um, are those consolidation functions should be immune to re or to being reapplied to itself so if you do an average of an average you get an average 
doesn't matter. You can, you can re-average, average, whatever. It, it doesn't change the outcome. Whether you do the averaging on the original data or you re-average averages, you still get the same average. Same thing happens for min and max. If you do max of original data or max of max data, you still get the maximum. But there are some consolidation functions which are very attractive, but they don't hold true for that requirement. So depending on what the original data is, even if it's calculated incrementally, it doesn't work when you reapply the same function to the result of the first. And therefore, it's limited. On the other hand, things happening in the charting module could be more evolved. So there are also consolidation functions there, like you can call with v def, like min, max, average. You could have many more there because there the data is only, it's only applied once and then it goes on to, into the graph. But for basic consolidation functions, I haven't come up with any others than, than those. But if you know any, it's, that would be rather easy to put in. It's just that it seems not to be the case. So data validation. The motivation behind RDTool's data validation function is that RDTool often runs without anyone paying close attention to it. It just chunks along and stores data. And then data gets averaged and you might not see the original data ever. You only see it once it's been munched away. And so someone should at least take a little care to make sure that whatever ends up in your RD file is not complete rubbish. And RD tool lets you define some basic properties on the data source to make sure that only data which could be valid goes into storage. And that's the, the reason for the ability to, to define data, data source validation. So what can you do? Minimum, maximum. Minimum, maximum. And for the, count, for the counter, there's a basic check that the counter doesn't decrease. Yeah, that's right. And, Something else. and the third uh, or fourth is uh, mi minimal heartbeat rate. So you can tell RD tool that it should ignore, let's put it in a different way. RD tool assumes that the data is a continuous flow. It's not just single points in time. It, it at least in the charts, it uh, creates the impression that you have a continuous stream of information. But if your original data is too far apart, you can't really claim that you know what happened in between. And RD tool has an option called minimal required heartbeat for each data source where you can tell RD tool that it should not accept data if it's too far apart, the two data inputs you create. And by doing that, you can make sure that your graph will actually have a gap because there wasn't any data available and you don't create any false claims. RD tool internally spends quite a lot of time or code or brain on dealing with unknown data. So it's not zero unknown data. Unknown data is just unknown. So what happens when you add 20 to unknown, what do you get? Unknown. Unknown? But when you, uh, when you multiply unknown by 100,000 and then at 20, does he help? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's really, really hard. So, because people say, yeah, but I have only one unknown and I have so much known data. How can it be that that one unknown data bit affects my whole, like I have this sum made out of hundreds of different data sources and one of the data sources is unknown and in the end, Everything's unknown. That's just unfair. Um, <coughs> now, what people do is they find ways around it. Now, with CDEF, the, the RPN language, you can test for unknown. And then you can say, OK, if it's unknown, uh, for me, then it's zero. Why ever someone thinks that unknown is zero, but they, OK, then it's zero. And then 
they, uh, they add some additional code in their CDEF expressions and still add it up. Recently, I added a new function call, called add none, which does exactly that. So you can add things together, taking none into consideration. The normal uh, way RD tool deals with none is that obviously if, it, if none goes into any mathematical operation, the whole thing normally just becomes unknown because it's just unknown. But for consolidation of data, there's a thresholding mechanism. So when, you were, when you're looking at data, before it goes into a round robin archive, and part of your data is unknown, you could argue that because for 90% of the time, I know that the average uh, rate of um, the average uh, speed of my internet uplink has been at, uh, at 40 megabit. I could make a case that it's probably for the whole hour it has been at 40 megabit. And so RD2 lets you specify uh, an, a percentage of time for each RRA where you require the data to be valid in order to warrant a valid entry into the RRA. That's the X file factor. XF, XX, X, X file, XFF of each round robin archive. Normally, people set it to, to 0 0.5, meaning 50% of the data has to be valid in order to create a valid entry. But you might say, yeah, I, I don't want to take any chances. I want to have 100% valid data in order to create a valid um, entry in the consolidated data. And then, you could set it to one. The, the problem is that then if you have long consolidation intervals for maybe a week and you have one value missing in there, your whole week would go unknown. And for most applications, that's not acceptable. And so it makes sense to set it somewhere reasonable so that things normally don't go unknown un unless they're really unknown for a week. Question? So when you're collecting data on a source that, you know, say between 50 and 100 normally, <coughs> and then for some reason you get a value in the database that's a million. You already have it in the database. Well, it's already gotten it's already gotten in there. It's some like the stuff you did, the data validation is to prevent that from happening. Uh-huh. In the event you've already got it in there. Ah, you, you haven't set the the, the the entries, and then you find, ah, I should have, but you didn't, and then it's already in there. So for that 24-hour graph, you know, everything is going to be and then when you go to the week graph, even though it moves up, then it's a week, and the month graph, can you extract Fix it. that data? Okay, there are two things you could do. You, you could do... You, okay. First thing you could do is you could work at the graph level. You could limit the, the data as it comes in yeah. and then just turn it into unknown if it's above 100 and your graph would still look okay and you wouldn't have to modify the original data. The other thing you could do is you could use RD tool tune to modify those limits. Now that would not do anything to the old data yet, but it would prevent future problems. And then what you can do is you can use RD tool dump to turn it into an XML. And then you can use RD tool restore together with mm, some special option, which then makes sure that the data as it's coming in is following those restrictions. And then it would uh, turn them into unknowns, those spikes. Yeah. Yeah. But it's really, I think there's also that, that question whether you should get into a habit of modifying old data because it's, it's tampering with the data to some extent. As you say, okay, that's, a, that's actually a wrong measurement, but it's very close to saying, yeah, that's an unfortunate measurement. It's not actually wrong, but we haven't done that, no. <laughs> and so 
by, by making the policy to not change all data, but rather maybe limit the graph, you could still then remove the limit from the graph and, and show what is actually being stored. So to say, no one of you reacted when I said that you, by setting up a graph, you, you decide on what people read from the graph. But I, are you aware of that? Because it's, it's really in your power to, to decide what, what people then decide based on, your, on the information you provide. Even though that might be very innocent, but it's, I think, in a sense, it's even worse when you just create a graph without thinking what people might make from this, because then they, they might just make any very stupid decisions, and you know better. So at least think what people might draw from this graph because you're stacking things on top of each other. What is the effect of this? Do you want that effect? Maybe people will use that to decide that they need to abandon a program because it's costing too much, because all the costs of the different components are stacked on, on top of each other in the graph. And if you had a graph which didn't show that consolidated view, nobody would ever get the idea that it's costing too much. Also, color choices can matter because green normally means it's okay and red normally means it's not okay. So depending on which color you choose for drawing something, people might come to the conclusion, oh, that's bad, we, we need to do something there. Because it might be that some of your graphs end up in a yearly report presented to the dean of the university and he has no idea about anything regarding that graph, but if it looks pleasing, it might even end up in his report to some other guy who then decides something based on this graph. And it's out of your hands. And so be careful. Nobody will ever go back and want to look at the original data. They just see the graph and say, ah. Oh. RD tool uh, 1.4, by the way, has some very nice uh, options to please your uh, corporate identity people. So it allows you to use any true type font for labeling your graphs. This means you can use your corporate or university standard font in your graphs, and if they have to go into the yearly report, that looks much better than if you use some arbitrary font from your whatever box you're, you're creating your graphs on. Also, you can export the graphs as PDF files. And graphics people's people, they just love PDF files because then they can integrate them into their uh, InDesign or whatever they're using for publishing and have very good looking graphs. And the chances that those graphs will end up in the yearly report is much higher than if you give them a PNG. So just tell RD tool to export PDF it's just a command line option, image format equals PDF, and you get a, a high quality PDF file. No, no, it no, vector? it's a vector file. It's a real vector file, and it, it's really is looking there, good. Is there a way to get rid of the uh, label on the side? <laughs> yes, there's an option. <laughs> Uh, that's the only option which is not documented. Ah. <laughs> so you have to read the source. Well <laughs> but there's an option. Actually, there's a company. Uh, they paid me for adding that option. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but I didn't, didn't put it in documentation. But if you go to GitHub, you can find it. And it's even, it has a sensible name. It's not some arbitrary jumble of, of letters which... Uh, minus, minus, hide, minus Toby? <laughs> no, it's something else. Height, but maybe hide, or no, or some. It's all out there. <laughs> GitHub is even searchable. Yeah. And if you search for GetOpt in the uh, RD tool source, then you find all the locations yeah. where GetOpt is. Be and it, it must be somewhere in the graph tool, so it must be RD underscore graph GetOpt, and then uh, it shouldn't be far. <coughs> OK, coupling of data values. I was just talking to some people in the break, and uh, I, I heard that OpenNMS uh, always keeps one data source in one RD file, unless you do special configurations. So by default, it's one RD per data source. And that's actually quite a sensible decision, I think, because there are not that many 
cool tools to modify existing RD files. And since all data sources in one RD file have to be updated together in step, so to say, this means that if you decide to modify the data sources in RD or if you, if you keep multiple data sources in an RD file, then the chances that you have to modify that RD file are growing. You also get faster by putting more things into the RD file, but unless you have a very stable environment, the price is probably too high because you lose a lot of flexibility. Things I would consider putting into the same RD file are properties of a port in a, in a router. So because SNMP is pretty stable regarding what sort of information you can get from a network port, you could, I think, reasonably build an RD file containing all the data sources coming from a single network port. Quite many already, but that I think would be okay. Also, if you get a new type of network card, you might or which maybe has other additional properties, you might want to store that in a new RD file anyway. So who of who of you is writing code in Perl? Some? Okay. Me too. <laughs> so Perl was the first uh, <coughs> API for RD tool, and it's still the one I'm using most of the time. Over time, many other people have contributed code to integrate RD tool in other languages. And as new features are added to RD tool, I also get to modify those integrations. So I know a bit about integrating into Python, integrating into Ruby, Lua, uh, Tico. Not Java, though. That's been, it's not in the, in the RD tool source code, the, the Java integration that's happening. I don't know, is, is that maintained by OpenNMS or who's doing JNI? <laughs> I, I think there is somewhere a wrapper for RD tool um, for Java, which points to a wiki page on the OpenNMS side. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not sure who's really maintaining it. So it's <laughs> abandonware. <laughs> okay. The, that interface doesn't change that often, so it's, it's uh, probably still working fine. I think. There are two versions. One's J. Robin and the other one's J. R. D. J. Robin is the standalone right. thing. And yeah. J. R. D. is pointing to the OpenMMS page, I think. Um, so you're maintaining it. Congratulations. Um, yeah, I don't know about the, the, um, the Java integration. For, for Perl, one important thing to know is the way RD tool handles errors in, in Perl and, and other implementations as well. RD tool doesn't do exceptions generally. So if something you do fails, then RD tool doesn't die. It just complains. And the complaining happens by the RD tool error function. So after executing an RD tool command, you have to ask the RD tool bindings whether they're still okay. And that's done by calling RDS, which is the, the, the bindings module error. And if error contains something, it's the error message. Otherwise, you might end up in a situation where you think your code is running fine, except that error RD tool is unhappy about whatever and doesn't tell you and no graph is created and you never know because your Perl program or your Python program runs without the hitch. And the interesting information would be in that RD error message all the time. Okay, monitoring a, uh, a Linux box, looking at its traffic. Has anyone ever done that without 
Any tooling? <laughs> so that, that's just this, this exercise. There's, there's this file. You can actually find that on your box. And that file contains all the interesting counters. Whenever you look at it, it contains new information. And so writing your own monitoring for Linux network traffic is very simple. You just parse that file every now and then and put the counters into an RD file. And you already have your, your monitoring system. Then you need to create some graphs and so on. But that's pretty easy. <coughs> data resampling. RD tool does data resampling. I've, I've been talking about this at length. But interestingly enough, it's, it's coming back as a topic on the RD tool mailing list every now and then. And people have this strange um, tendency to, to want to keep the original data. And nothing is able to, to dissuade them from this conviction. What they seem to be thinking is that if I, by chance, measured at the right moment and caught that spike, I don't want to lose that information. Even though if I had measured the data two seconds later, I had missed the spike. And I'm only looking at the data every five minutes anyway. So that I found this one spike is pure chance. And in my eyes, it's only fair that RD tool averages this spike out. Because you're looking at the data every five minutes, so one spike doesn't have any influence. But they say, no, I want to keep the original data. And, and they go to, to strange lengths to achieve that. So one way to make sure that RD tool keeps the data you're putting into it is that instead of telling RD tool about the actual acquisition time of your data, you use a rounding function to modify the acquisition time to always align with the intervals you set up for your RD database. So if you set up your RD database to accept data every five minutes, RD tool will resample the data into five minutes intervals. So by modifying the timestamp of the data you're feeding to RD tool to agree with those five minute intervals, RD tool will not do any resampling of your data and you get back your original data. It's very cool. It's very wrong, but very cool. Um, so I, I recently, not recently, a few years ago, I had this row, real row on the mailing list with some guy who was very upset about RD tool. He was monitoring his modem bank. And do you know modem bank? So you have this rack on the wall with hundreds of modems for people dialing in to your university for example, or into your ISP to get onto the internet. Um, he was monitoring that modem bank, and he had this wonderful method to figure out how many modems were active at any point in time. Now, maybe you've never, who has, who has seen a modem? OK, so modems, they come in, in units of one. So you have a modem, and it's either connected or not, right? obvious. So if you count the number of modems in the modem bank which is connected, or who are connected, and whatever, which are connected, uh, you get an even number. Or not an even number, you get a, what's it called? A, a whole number. Integer. integer number, right? It's always an integer. Must be, because it's always a modem is connected or not. And so he fed those numbers into RD2. And then he drew graphs. And what happened in the graphs? There were half modems and quarter modems being connected. <laughs> he, he was unable to, to comprehend why RD tool was make, mocking him, basically, by creating those half modems, which obviously you can look at rack, they don't exist. But RD tool is making them up and telling him that over the course of the last half hour, he had 3.5 modems connected. So he wanted me to fix RD tool.
actually quite fun to read the archives of the RG tool mailing list. <coughs> I haven't been talking a lot about timestamps in RG tool. I mentioned that timestamps are Unix timestamps, meaning seconds since 1970. Um, whenever you're looking at a timestamp in RD tool, you can use the seconds since 1970, except that using seconds since 1970 by hand is not so, well, it's geeky, but it's, it's not very accessible. And so RD tool allows you to use some more user-friendly syntax as well in the graphing module, not in the, in the update module, but you can write things like now plus two days and it'll create a, a graph which ends at now plus two days. Except it wouldn't contain any data, but <laughs> <laughs> you could also do now <laughs> minus two days. <laughs> Okay, uh, gprint al already showed up in, in the morning's talk. gprint is a function for printing numerical data into a chart. It also has a cousin called print without the G. And using print and graph V, you can easily output data calculated in the graph into normal data accessible through your wrapper script. So. Some people are using RD tool graph in order to analyze the data without ever creating a graph. <coughs> if you don't put any graphing instructions into RD tool, so no line, no area, no H rule, no V rule, then RD tool will not create the graph. But you can still do def, C def, V def, uh, print. And you get the data out. So you can use RD graph as a data analysis engine. And it's pretty fast because it's written in C. So that might be a good way to look at the data and because the, it doesn't have to create the graph and it doesn't have to compress the resulting PNG image. It's actually much faster than just creating a graph. question, wouldn't export be a good alternative? The, the cool thing about export is that you can get at the actual data making up the line in the graph. And if you want that data, then you would want to use export. If you're just interested in consolidated data, you don't have to go to, to export. Export, I didn't talk about export at all in the morning. Export is another function of RD tool, it works a little like RD graph, except that it never creates a graph. It lets you, out, lets you access the lines making up the graph, or the, the coordinates for the lines making up the graph. So if you were to write a JavaScript module for your browser to interactively create graphs using uh, D3 and, and some additional libraries to create beautiful graphs. Then you could use export on the server side to prepare the data and then just send it to the browser. Export has all the abilities of RD graph, so it can consolidate the data. It can reduce the amount of data which has to be sent to the server. So it would actually make a lot of sense to use RD export to prepare data prior to sending it to the server, uh, to, the, to the browser. Some people have implemented uh, solutions where they read the actual RD file in JavaScript on the browser. And you'll find such a project, I think it's JSRD or something. Uh, but the problem there is that you read a large file potentially on the browser and then it's compressed and everything. So there's much too much data transfer going on to be sane. <coughs> I 
WebView has a compiled RD tool. Hand compiled. One, two, great. <laughs> Recently, <laughs> one, no? Um, <laughs> not, not hand compiled. <laughs> so uh, if you look at the RD tool versions in your Linux distros, I think, I, I don't, what's, what's installed here? I haven't even looked at it yet. No, that's cool. So Ubuntu being uh, very up to date, and then this being the latest Ubuntu, got the latest version of RD tool. But if you're stuck on Red Hat 5, for example, or Red Hat 6, you're bound to have RD tool 1.2 or even 1.0, something old. And <coughs> while there have been many feature enhancements. There have also been many bug fixes in the meantime. And it's sort of sad to work with such an old uh, package. And therefore, if you're doing a large project with RD tool, I think it might be a good idea to spend some time compiling RD tool on the target system. And since compiling software has become sort of a, a dying art these days, <laughs> I created a little helper system to make that easier. Ah, God, I hate that interface. Why is it going up here? Uh, die, die, die. No, Windows you key. Can, you can use the Alt key and move the window while clicking directly. Ah, now that's cool. Thank you. OK, so uh, going back to GitHub. <coughs> I have this little project there. Uh, repositories. Simple dependency build scripts. Because sometimes I work for customers and they tell me, yeah, that has to run on this, uh, what is it? Oh, Red Hat 5, yes, it has to run there. And they say, yeah, but... They say, no. Can I install something? Yes, no problem. And then, OK, so uh, can you, can you uh, put Perl 5.12 on there? Do you have an RPM for that? No. OK, then you have to compile it yourself. And so um, what I did is I created this little shell include script, which knows how to compile things. And so now, if you want to build RD tool 147 on a target system, you just run this little script here, which includes SDBS. And then it downloads and builds all the dependencies of RD tool. So you get get text for internationalization, XML, you get libpng, you get expat, you get free type, you get font config, pixman, all of those guys necessary to compile RD tool, which is compiled at the very end. And the cool thing about this is, in order to add something to this system, all you have to do in the normal case is this. Simple build, where it's to be found, and the archive. And the rest is taken care of by the magic script. And in this uh, archive here, you find other recipes as well. So you can build all the pearls you want. Um, there's a recipe for RCS log, for the Oracle Perl database interface. And I've come to, to using that system for all my tools. So whenever, what it also can do is it can build all the Perl dependencies you need. So whenever I'm writing something, I always create a build script with this and include it with the package so that when you have to deploy that package somewhere, where dependencies are missing, you just run the build script and it gets all built into a directory where my program is being installed. Yeah, and, and 4.3 is 
the exercise I was actually hoping someone would do is to create a little uh, web graphing tool with RD tool using export and the D3 library. But unfortunately, none of you were pulling. So sad. But if I ever get a week off, that's what I'm going to do. Okay, which brings us to half past two, the end of this uh, second unit. Any last questions you want to ask? Yes. Okay, so uh, what's the, uh, how, how I came up with the idea? Uh, okay, so he, he found, he was looking for a book on RD tool but didn't find any and now you're asking whether I want to write the book or you want to know how I got the idea to write RD tool yeah. or both. Unfortunately, writing a book is a uh, very sad occupation, I think, because there is no money in it. <laughs> and very few people get famous by writing a book. Some people get really famous, but I unfortunately don't have, consider myself to have the skills to write a successful book. So I would write a sad book, which nobody would read, and uh, I would spend lots of time and be really sad about it myself in the end. So what I, what I can tell you is how I got to write RD Tool, because I, I hear that downstairs they're also telling a story how I got to write RD Tool, which is wrong. So uh, <coughs> the first thing I wrote was MRTG, the Multi Router Traffic Grapher. And at the time I was working at the university in the UK as a uh, apprentice system administrator. And um, that university with 20,000 students had an uplink to the internet through a 64k uh, bit circuit. And it was a multi-campus university, so it had uh, special links between the universities to distribute these 64ks uh, all throughout the different... This, yeah, it was really sad. I mean, they had good infrastructure locally, they just didn't have the, the uplink. And so the uplink basically was always full. And working at Central Networking, we often got calls from people saying, is the internet broken? And no, it's not broken. It's just working at full capacity and it's just slow. And so I was looking for a way to, to make people understand that it's full. Because it was actually also a problem of allocating the money to buy a fast link. And so I, I came up with MRGG to graphically represent what is happening on that link. And my first attempts were built on GNU plot and uh, some little Perl script pulling SNMP. And then over time I developed MRTG and found that people started using MRTG for other things, like not for traffic monitoring. Because it seemed at that time it was the only tool capable of gathering data from somewhere and putting it, it into a graph and, and doing that at some scale. And so I thought that it might make sense to, to write a tool which just implements the set, sort of the central idea of, RD, of MRTG, the ability to pull in data, store it in a sensible way and then create a graph. And then I designed it and spent hours and hours coding it and eventually in 90, no, 99 I published RD tool. In 95 I published MRTG. And uh, it was two months of the time I spent implementing RD tool were paid for by CADA, the uh, network people at the com supercomputer center in San Diego, and the rest was my spare time. So you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Mm -hmm. 
Yes, there, there are. So the question is how, how can I influence the scaling of the RD graph? By default, RD tool auto scales everything and you don't have to care. But if you have two graphs sitting next to each other, then uh, it's a problem. Uh, <coughs> the options you can use is our lower limit and upper limit. Even up, it's maybe not named very, very cleverly, but upper limit lets you fix the upper end of the graph at some point. But when the content of the graph goes over that limit, it'll adjust itself. So it might solve part of your problem. If you want to make sure that the graphs sort of <coughs> don't look at their content, they just stick the way they are, there is another option called rigid which you can call. And then it doesn't change at all anymore. But you have to specify upper and lower limit. And the other thing you could also do, you could use CDEF to limit the data actually displayed in the graph. And then the auto scaling will automatically, will not be affected by the content because the content will already be limited when it, at the point in time when it gets drawn. Okay, that concludes today's performance. Thank you for your attendance. I wish you all a great rest of the conference.